Hi, Brink. How Hi, Josh. How are you? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, brief uh, introductions of uh, ourselves. Uh, I'm uh, Josh Cohen. I'm sitting in uh, San Francisco. I uh, am editor of Boston, co-editor of Boston Review, uh, which I've been doing since 1991. I am teaching at Apple University and also at University of California, Berkeley. And I'm Brink Lindsay. I'm uh, here in Washington, D.C. I'm VP for policy at the Niskanen Center, I think, here in town. Yeah. Uh, it's been something close to a year in, in uh, calendar time since we did one of these things. In, in Trump years, that's about four million <laughs> years, something like that. <laughs> it is an exhausting, uh, it's an exhausting time. But, and we, we've been, uh, I was trying to remember when we started on this, it was back in the early days of your libertarian initiative. And yeah, I, 2007, 2008, sometime a long time ago. It was probably 2007. I think it was really before the financial crisis. It was yeah. in, uh, you know, uh, at, at a time when we thought, uh, you know, George W. Uh, Bush was uh, terrible and uh, the Iraq war was a disaster. Of course, the Iraq war was a disaster and George W. Bush was terrible. But anyway, there are other things on the table. Yes. What, what we have learned in the past two years is it can always get worse and always get worse. There's, yeah, uh, sort of a variant of uh, a Kafka statement that there's infinite hope, but not for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so we were going to, I thought we'd talk today some about this uh, policy essay, I'll hold it up here, uh, that uh, you and Will Wilkinson, Steve Tellis, and uh, Sam Hammond did for the Niskanen Center. It's called The Center Can Hold, Public Policy for an Age of Extremes. Uh, and it's gotten a bunch of attention. Uh that's good. It deserves to get a bunch of attention. Uh, it's an illuminating piece, an effort to be constructive uh, at a time when uh, constructiveness doesn't always get rewarded. Um, broadly speaking, uh, I'd say the focus, you'll correct anything that I say that's uh, off the rails here, but broadly speaking, the focus is on domestic U.S. policy. There are some side forays into issues around foreign policy, particularly security policy, and a little bit on trade policy, but basically about domestic uh, American policy. And the uh, broad goals in value terms are uh, restoring a world of uh, equality of opportunity and, and, and of shared uh, prosperity, uh, doing so by restoring uh, a capacity for effective uh, governance. Um, uh, and uh, in service of that uh, set of goals, opportunity, shared prosperity, and effective gov governance in support of them, uh, the document promises, and this is your phrase, um, a whole new way of thinking. You're smiling. I'm smiling. Uh, that felt a little bit like an uh, overselling of what you were doing. And, l and let me say why, and I, I don't mean this in a churlish spirit. Uh, it didn't feel to me uh, like a whole new way of thinking. It felt to me uh, like uh, the kind of things that were said um, uh in the Clinton administration uh, about, you know, the era, the era of big government is over. That was a, a way you put it from the uh, Democratic Party side. A, a mix of things that were said in the Clinton administration with, uh, you know, a kind of soup song, Jason Furman and, um, and maybe uh, Cass Sunstein. Um, uh, and uh it's okay if it's not, you know, if it's not a whole new way of thinking. A whole new way of thinking, if it's wrong, I'd rather have an older way of thinking that's right. Okay, so, I, but but uh, I raise this issue about whether it's really a whole new way of thinking, because if it's a, a way of thinking that's really more familiar, it's been tried out, 
had a bunch of some, maybe arguably some successes, also arguably lots of failures. Uh, it would be good to know, uh, is it really like that? And if it's different, uh, how is it different? Again, not for the purposes of really saying, is it new or is it not new, but for the purposes of understanding the strengths and the, the, the core features, the strengths and the weaknesses. So what do you think? Yeah, that's a great setup, uh, uh, Josh. And uh, you, you, you get to a, an, an immediate vulnerability with the whole project, but one that I think that we understand and, and have uh, responses to. Um, but first, whole new uh, relative to the current dominant uh, uh, mass belief systems on offer, um, mm. uh, in which uh, the, the kind of central uh, argument we make in this paper is to attack uh, the false dichotomy that is at the heart of the classic left-right uh, debate on the uh, on the uh, proper role of government, uh, where you have uh, uh, sort of uh, enthusiasm for government and uh, hostility, skepticism towards markets lumped together in the classic pro-government left side and enthusiasm for markets and hostility towards government lumped together uh, in the, uh, the sort of conventional uh, uh, right-wing side. Uh, so uh, we have the pro-government forces versus the, uh, the pro-market forces and, uh, and <clears throat> things often get uh, framed that way uh, that, uh, that um, what <clears throat> that things that confer high status on government uh, officials because they're public servants, uh, that, that fits the progressive line, and things that convey low status on, on business people who are plutocrats or, or, uh, or rent seekers, that's uh, a progressive line. Meanwhile, you have the flip sort of emotional valences on the right wing side. Uh, they're not public servants, they're bureaucrats. They're not plutocrats, they're job creators. Uh, so you mix together everything. Uh, uh, whereas we think uh, uh, we think the appropriate stance is to be pro government and pro market uh, that uh, mm -hmm. that the market economy is at the heart of uh, of a well functioning market uh, well functioning modern social order uh, but that that market order requires uh, uh, significant energetic government uh, to provide the proper framework and backing uh, and in particular uh, uh, there is a complementarity between social spending uh, by government uh, and and creative destruction by the marketplace that is not generally seen uh, by the uh, kind of conventional interpretations of left and right today. So I think, yeah. I think there is a real break uh, to uh, to these days. We see as as Democrats are kind of lurching leftward, uh, we see a rediscovery of democratic socialism and a, just an outright hostility to markets and to uh, rich people, however they got rich. Um, even if they got rich building a great new mousetrap, just uh, that kind of old style anti-market, anti-commerce leftism is rearing up uh, and it is allying itself with a desire to make government do a bunch of, uh, uh, take on a bunch of tasks that need doing. Um, um, so we're getting that false dichotomy really cropping up, I think, in a more vivid way than, than we've had in years past. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, in that sense, I think what we're, we're saying is new and sounds different from what the, the leading uh, two sides are saying. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's new in a what's old is new again kind of way, because all we're saying is that the classic model uh, that in the, in the great 20th century battle of systems between capitalism and socialism, what won uh, was the hybrid, the capitalist welfare state, uh, um, and that's the correct model, uh, and, uh, and we need to not abandon that model, not try to trash that model as the right wants to do, or completely rethink it as the left now wants to do, but uh, simply make it work better. Uh, and, uh, and it's on that score, I think, that there is a clear difference once you dive below the kind of uh, 30,000 feet rhetoric and start looking at programs, I think you'll see a very clear difference uh, between uh, what we're saying now and kind of third way Clintonism approaches of the 90s. Uh, the big picture rhetoric is the same, that we need government and the market and they need to work together and complement each other. Uh, but I think uh, what, what has become clear in recent years 
uh, is that the 90s style third wayism uh, suffered from, uh, understandably, it was at a different time and we were undergoing different challenges and we knew different things back then. Uh, but in retrospect, we see a real complacency about, uh, about structural problems in capitalism. Uh, so third wayism came online with the fall of the Berlin Wall and with the triumph of, uh, of, of market economies relative to central planning. Uh, and not only that, uh, but the 90s uh, were, showed the United States, the relatively laissez-faire small government United States, roaring ahead with an internet boom as its uh, apparent capitalist competitor, Japan Inc., fell by the wayside and its capitalist competitors in the welfare states of Europe, struggling with double-digit unemployment. So all during Blair and Clinton time, you have, you're faced with the prospect of American-style capitalism just apparently beating the pants off of all rivals. And it was, I think, understandable that that triumph led to triumphalism and led to this idea that we basically figured out how to do wealth creation. We need to tweak social policy here and there. We need to improve the welfare state here and there. Uh, but we basically understand how uh, how uh, how the market economy is supposed to be structured, and we've figured it out better than anybody else. And all other countries are kind of converging over time onto the American model. Yeah, you know, this was a, that brief moment when history was over, when the you know Golgotha of the spirit had come to rest, and turned out not to be over, but just uh, taking a little holiday for exactly. And so, uh, as uh, as Steve Tellis and I tell in our book, The Captured Economy, kind of during this period of complacency, when we figured we had sort of figured out capitalism and it was the best system and we knew how to do it, yeah. uh, you had all these kind of termites, uh, uh, you know, gnawing away at the at the foundations of prosperity, uh, real deep seated rent seeking and regulatory capture. Uh, distorting the rules of, uh, of capitalism in a way that's very bad for dynamism and growth, that very bad for everybody's long-term interests, uh, and very good for uh, insider and rich people's short-term interests. Uh, and so I think uh, our, uh, our version of, of celebrating the, 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 the middle way of the capitalist welfare state uh, looks very different because it's one that's that's acutely aware of structural flaws in the current model and of the need for bold reforms in that model uh, that, that feels very different from the kind of sunny, we figured it all out attitudes of the 90s. So the, 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 the style, the, 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 the leading thought about um, uh, how to think about the market economy and uh, how to think about markets and, um, you know, income security, you know, at the same time needing yep. both of them. Uh, it, it, it has a certain resonance, at least at, I don't know, 10,000 feet with uh, the system in uh, one of uh, everyone's favorite countries, Denmark, uh, the, the flex security system. So the flex security system is supposed to marry these two virtues, flexibility and security provides flexibility and that it's relatively easy for companies to be creatively destructive, a AKA uh, laying off uh, employees. But at the same time, it provides security, not only income security, but uh, an active labor market policy with yep. job training, et cetera, et cetera. That seems like the kind of thing that uh, you all uh, like, here's one thing about Denmark um, that makes it possible to do that, uh, which is there's about, I think, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but, you know, it's, it's good enough for blogging heads work. I mean, let's say it's about a 70 or 75 percent union density in um, uh, 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 Denmark. So you get this marriage of flexibility and uh security for, uh, uh, for, for workers, uh, because, uh, not because of a promise and not because of government policy, but because they're really highly, uh, organized. And, uh, if you don't, uh, uh, ensure some kind of security, uh, you don't get your, uh, flexibility. So there's, and, and I give that as an example because, one of the things that feels like a, you know absent from the, the 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 story that you tell, generalizing on the Denmark example, 
is any kind of organized power on the part of people who are in particularly vulnerable positions uh, to protect themselves. Now, and let me be clear about this. Uh, you know, you guys talk in your thing about uh, deliberative constraints on policy making, and you know, deliberation is about reasoning about stuff. That's what it basically means. And I'm a long-standing deliberative Democrat, wrote and writing about it for more than 30 years. Uh, I like uh, reason, and I like deliberative uh, democracy, but I've always thought that. Uh, the only way to really make deliberation work, let's sit down and reason together about this, is if uh, people who are in more vulnerable positions have exit options and they can say, if you don't reason with us, we're going to be we're going to be able to impose some serious costs on you. So both sides have capacity to impose serious costs on the other side and then they can reason together and work something out. Uh, as opposed to just saying, you know, to people who are in an incredibly vulnerable position, uh, we're going to, you know, let's be reasonable about this. Uh, that's just, uh, it's a, a, you know, a, you know, a sucker's game. Uh, and so that piece of, uh, you know, broadly speaking about power and, uh, and it's not just about government, but it's about there being a kind of s strong social basis for the kind of, you know, reasonable social policy that you're exploring. That kind of seems absent to me. I know you're not hostile to it, but it's not there. Yeah. So, I, I, again, there's only so, with this, yeah. this piece, we, you know, uh, uh, we get to say one big thing, uh, but it's not everything we want to say, but we, yeah. we get to say one big thing, which is that this false dichotomy is wrong. We need to figure out a way to make market and government work together and support each other. Uh, uh, what, what then needs to be said next is how to, how to actually make that happen. Why aren't they working together well today? Uh, and, and uh, so what's the diagnosis? Of what's, uh, and here is an area where for sure my thinking has changed considerably uh, over the years. Um, on a, on a couple of different scores. First, uh, I'm, uh, I'm deeply impressed uh, these days with the importance of representation, uh, not just as an end in itself, but as, as a means towards sound policymaking. Uh, a lot of that was an outgrowth of writing The Captured Economy with Steve Tellis. So that was a partnership of, of a policy wonk and a political scientist. And uh, for me, just that partnership, I learned a lot. Uh, and the, the main big thing I learned from Steve uh, in writing this was that whenever you've identified a bad policy, uh, you've, you need to then look for what the flaw in the policymaking process is that produced that. If, you, if you've got defective products, you know, being produced by the factory, you got to find somewhere on the assembly line where, where the process has gone wrong and is producing those defects. Um, and in general, uh, the, the sort of defect number one uh, for bad policies is an absence of representation. That when particular interests, uh, uh, but <clears throat> when particular interests that have a stake in a policymaking venture completely dominate uh, the rulemaking process and other implicated interests are completely absent from the process, you can, you can pretty much expect that those absent guys are going to get rolled. Uh, and so uh, I, this has changed my thinking dramatically on, on voting and voter suppression. In the past, as a libertarian, I just didn't give a fig about voter turnout. I thought most people who didn't turn out were incredibly, you know, uh, low information uh, voters to begin with, and their their voice their, they didn't have any ideological coherence to them. So it wasn't like they were going to tend one way or another. Uh, so they were just kind of a wash. Um, on the union side, uh, all I ever thought about unions was their economic impact. Um, which I continue to think Wagner Act unionism in the United States had very deleterious consequences for the industries that it, uh, that it dominated. Um, but, uh, but I have come to see that the absence of political representation, uh, it's not that it, you know, what matters isn't that those folks have clever ideas about public policy that are getting missed out on. And so evaluating them, evaluating their exclusion on, on what kind of ideas they have about policy is the wrong idea. Uh, what they, even if you don't know how to make a shoe, you, you know whether it fits or not. Uh, and so 
just being able to say ouch uh, when a policy hurts you uh, is a vital, Im vitally important part of representation. And when those people aren't represented, we don't hear their ouches. And so it gets left, it gets left out of the mix. In the union case, I am convinced uh, that, uh, that while uh, sort of in the New Deal era, we had lots of rent seeking and regulatory mm -hmm. capture, but the distributional consequences went all over the map. There was downward redistribution, upward redistribution, sideways redistribution. Now in rent seeking and regulatory capture, it's almost all going upward. Uh, why is that? Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced that the absence of, of unions, uh, the, the, the dramatic decline in their uh, economic and political power, and therefore in the representation of working person, you know, working class interests in policymaking has had a big effect. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, um, I'm, I'm afraid the name of the fellow is now popped out of my head, but he's a guy at Harvard who's written about uh, <clears throat> political unions as a possible idea that, yeah. that, that can we divorce collective bargaining from, from, uh, from worker collectives that have a collective political voice. Uh, so uh, whether we, I, I don't think we're going back to Wagner Act unionism, yeah. uh, but I do see the absence of worker representation as a, as a, as a big problem for our, for our yeah. political economy. Yeah. Uh, and, and also just for uh, sort of solidarity and, and a sense of place and status for working class people as well. I think that absence of representation yeah. is, yeah, I mean, basically, I think there are five ideas about labor law reform that that are, you know are kind of in the air, and they've always been in the air. I, you know, we're uh, I'm old enough to remember the previous eighty six times that they were uh, in the air, and you know, one of them is that you have to do something under the NL NLRA to make it easier for vul vulnerable uh, workers to uh, or organize, uh, collectively, you know, this is sort of, you know, farmers and, uh, you know, people who work in, uh, doing domestic care, uh, um, uh, you got to do something. I think you need to do, to do something to, um, make it easier for people to strike, you know, get rid of strike or replacement. Cause I mean, that's what, you know, that's where the power lies is an ability to uh, impose costs. And, uh, uh, and, and then, as I said before, you know, okay, I can impose costs on you. Now we can sit down and have a conversation as opposed to I can't impose any costs on you. And you say, let's sit down and reason uh, this thing through. Uh, third thing is uh, that you have to make it easier, I think, for people who are trying to collectively organize to get recognized. And, and these, here's where things get more ambitious. I mean, maybe there's, uh, there's you know, a fourth area, which is uh, sectoral bargaining. And then a fifth area where I think you, you, you uh, probably get more, even more nervous, uh, I guess, is uh, on uh, representation in the firm. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I get the, I, I get the nervousness and I also get the, all the reasons for not being nervous about that, for thinking it's essential. On the other hand, the source of the nervousness is that it makes it harder to be creatively destructive. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, let me rephrase that. On the one hand, it makes it hard to be creatively destructive. On the other hand, it makes it harder to be creatively destructive. Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, I think trying to figure out what mix of those five kinds of initiatives uh, is uh, appropriate is, a, is, you know, is a difficult, it's a difficult and complicated issue because there are mixes and matches of them in different uh, places, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, pursue the, uh, the, those five uh, policies in those five areas differently. But what I, what I am, uh, impressed by is that if you don't uh, do something, and I, I gather we're in, you know some agreement on this. If you don't do something on the uh, organization side, uh, enable people, make it easier for people to be uh, organized, uh, then they're going to get screwed, and we'll have uh, a whole you know. And in reading your thing, you have a you know a very good discussion in the document about the difficulties with the. Uh, China shock and all the, the consequences in terms of um, uh, employment and politics that came out of the uh, the China shock. Partly the WTO accession of China, but it all it actually extends a little earlier than that on most favored nation treatment. Uh, 
um, uh, and uh, th- so you say the kinds, this is one of the places where it felt to me like Clintonism. And, and I don't mean that, it, I'm not spitting when I say that. Right. I, uh, it felt like Clintonism where there's a, uh, you know, there's a recognition of the need for there to be something that is kind of the American version of active labor market policy to make sure that people don't get screwed by that kind of labor market shock. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the absence of, as you were saying, in the absence of serious representation that makes it possible for people to say, no, this is, you're not going to be able to do this and screw me uh, or make it harder to do that, uh, you end up with, um, uh, you know, a reduction of policies, which include a reduction of trade barriers and a lot of blah, 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 blah about all the the, uh, policies that you need to, you know, implement alongside of that. But those get, those seem very much secondary. That's, I think, the inevitable consequence of the way that power is organized. Yeah, so... (laughs) So just, you know, notwithstanding my thinking anew on these subjects, I, I think I'm still well to the right of you. Um, I hope so. <laughs> so I, 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 am, I am genuinely concerned about the effects of, of uh, labor cartels on creative destruction. Um, and I think, uh, I think uh, Wagnerite unions had very bad effects on steel industry and auto industry. Uh, uh, and I worry about uh, a, a return to those kinds of bad effects. If we return to the return to unionism, could bring a return to to or corporate level sclerosis or in, industri- industry level sclerosis. Um, uh, my colleague Sam Hammond uh, has written on on the the perils along those lines of of worker representation on corporate boards and yeah. reaction to the Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, uh, so on the, that said, the, the broad point about representation holds, uh, where I think, uh, the issues of representation are sort of most pressing and urgent today are, uh, are in the voting booth rather than, uh, at the union hall. Uh, so just getting people politically represented, uh, is, uh, is the first order of business, um, I, I do think, uh, and again, referring to my colleague Sam, uh, he's a big uh, proponent of, of, uh, of turning up the volume considerably on active labor market policies that we do need, uh, that, that if we're going to have creative destruction, let it rip and let some industries shrink rapidly so that others can grow rapidly, uh, uh, we do have to see that there are real labor market frictions and the government can help alleviate those frictions. I mean, yeah. people, uh, I, 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 a pretty assiduous reader of things that Sam writes, which are very um, illuminating and engaging, and uh, I, I, I enjoy uh, reading them and learn uh, from them. Uh, I, I guess so, the, well, just just as an aside, the, a fun thing about about this piece, which I put together, uh, but it's it's cobbled together from from previous writings from Steve Tellis and from Will Wilkinson and from Sam Hammond, and then I added kind of framing and and. Uh, but this is this libertarian idea, this way of borrowing from liberal and, and libertarian uh, buckets of ideas to come up with something newish uh, uh, is something that I've been working on for a dozen years. And I've been working on with Will and Steve yeah. Tellis for a dozen years. And Sam Hammond came along as kind of a Will Wilkinson protege and has uh, been uh, adding his own distinctive, unique contributions. And so, and through, a uh, wonderful happenstance. We all wound up at the same place in the Scannon Center. Uh, so uh, this was uh, th- th- these are kind of streams of thought that have been have been developing for quite some time. Uh, they're now in a new fact context. With all the shocking events that have occurred in recent years, uh, uh, and that those change the emphases and they change the way we conceive of things. But uh, but bringing all this together into one package uh, is a fun culmination of stuff that's been going along and percolating for quite some time. Yeah, I, I, I tried as I was reading to figure out uh, which were the 
parts that where Will had produced the first draft, which were the Sam. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I figured Will was responsible for this for the skepticism about ideal theory and for a little bit of the stuff about pluralism. I mean, not that you are you have any hesitations about those things and free market welfare state. I thought, hmm, sounds like Sam, but also uh, similar. Um, uh, and what? I guess I, as I'm reading the thing, and this goes back to the first point about, you know, Clintonism, uh, and again, not said not with, uh, as I'm spitting, but just as a kind of characterization of the sensibility, um, it, it felt much, I, I had a much clearer sense of uh, this as, uh, a, you know, a document addressed to people on the right as an effort to, you know, you know, have some, you know, tent pole themes or maybe even just the long pole of the tent in a, an alternative to the current, what, whatever it is on the right, the absence of, uh, the presence of Twitter and the absence of po serious uh, policy thinking. I, I just, just one sidebar point there. Uh, one of the things that I liked, one of the many things that I liked a lot about the document was that there was not a discussion of Trump. Uh, nothing was laid at the doorstep of Russia and or Putin. Uh, and it's that the story that you tell is not all about uh, social media rotting our uh, democratic uh, or otherwise democratically uh, inclined brains and sensibilities. Um, uh, it was actually one of the two things. Uh, the, the, the only other time I think that I spent about a you know a, some stretch of time uh, over the past couple of years and didn't hear Trump come up in a political context was when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez came to San Francisco, uh, in, uh, after she had won the primary and was in the general and she gave a talk for about 20 minutes or half an hour and did not once, uh, mention Donald Trump. And I thought, first of all, it was an incredible virtue. And secondly, that it showed a kind of uh, you know, discipline uh, that I, I thought was uh, admirable. Uh, anyway, you've got yeah, so, yeah, he's he's lurking on the in the background of this paper and 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 maybe mentioned once or twice, but but just in context that and the context is uh, that uh, um, not only are are we in a kind of an economic malaise of the 21st century where we're have slow growth and high inequality and and. Uh, um, much uh, inferior performance to what we were used to in the 20th century. Uh, not only do we have that, but we have this political crisis uh, of, of an unfit demagogue uh, in the White House and a, a political crisis that is due to a, a larger crisis of legitimacy. You don't get demagogues winning presidential elections unless there has been a broad-based loss of faith in governing elites and established institutions. And so uh, the, the first step in a crisis of legitimacy is to recognize it and to say that there has been a loss of faith and that means things aren't going well and we need to think anew and we need to make changes. And so it's that context, but but yes, the idea is to go forward. And in, and you mentioned here, and this is, a, I think, a good uh, segue, uh, that um, although uh, we present this uh, vision as as kind of transpartisan. It borrows ideas from left and right, and we expect that some of those policies are an easier sell to the left, and some will be an easier sell to the right. Uh, and so we see this policy vision kind of, you know, straddling the ideological divide and, and or transcending the ideological divide and, and, ca and capable of, of reaching to both sides. So that's going on. But at the same time, we say, but we're serious that this really is a legitimate center-right uh, position as well. So we are... Uh, we are positioning ourselves as part of uh, what is, frankly, right now, an imaginary center right. Uh, the, no, the, no. the Republican Party and the conservative movement are right now in the tank for Donald Trump. And, uh, and so uh, the uh, you know, alternatives uh, to the right of center are, are few on the ground. We see that there is a, there is a latent alternative. We saw all those uh, long-time Republicans abandoning their party in the midterms, uh, the suburban Republicans who voted D, uh, maybe for the first time in a long time. Um, uh, so there, there is, I think, some constituency uh, for 
moderate Republicans. Uh, but um, but right now uh, they are, uh, you know, they're a, they're an asterisk in, in, in uh, political power. Uh, and furthermore, what makes uh, pitching this kind of uh, pro-government, pro-market vision to, as a center-right vision, that's really novel because all 90s-style third-wayism, Blairism and Clintonism, that was a center-left venture. Uh, so the idea that you could be not of the left and still say government is essential and government social spending is, is a necessary foundation for a thriving market economy, that all sounds very, very new from an American right of center. Yeah, yeah. You know, there is, uh, in that connection, um, uh, I, uh, it's, I'm, I'm reminded of the comments that um, uh, Keynes made about Hayek's road to serfdom, uh, where, where, which th there were basically two responses to it. The first was that he expressed a great deal of admiration for it and said that there was you know, a great deal in it that he agreed with. Uh, the one thing, but then the second point was that the thing that he really couldn't understand about it was uh, how Hayek, uh, he couldn't understand Hayek's confidence in his ability to distinguish between the kinds of government engagement that he thought were essential to making market economies function and the kinds of government engagement that just stepped over some bright line and then we were on the slippery slope to serfdom and totalitarianism and uh, all of that kind of thing. So um, uh, it's not, I say that partly in the spirit of saying that I think it's not that surprising that something, that a program that was uh, advanced by the center left in, in the nineties could become the, a program of the center right with a little, you know, with some different, uh, shadings, et cetera, because there were, despite the animosities or intellectual animosities between, uh, Keynes and Hayek, and despite the fact that they're associated with these fundamentally different political, uh, sensibilities, uh, uh, and despite the fact that uh, Road to Serfdom is like the Reader's Digest version of, you know, the Constitution of Liberty and, uh, you know, and and, uh, uh, and Hayek's other work, there is, you know, Keynes could say, yeah, I, I, I like, I, I kind of, you know, I, I agree with uh, a, a great deal of what you're saying here. I just don't understand why you think we're, that we're going to hell in a handbasket if we do this one little thing that you don't like. Uh, it just I, 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 one suggestion uh, to make in the spirit of the earlier conversation about issues around power and representation, um, you know, you might have you know, one of the issues in, in this area. This is, you know, it's a political project. It's an intellectual project as well as a political project. Political project is partly a, a matter of who who's in the room where it's happening, as they say in Hamilton. And it might be a good idea for uh, a Niskanen event to uh, bring together people for, you know, who are interested in uh, uh, labor organizing, labor law reform, uh, not just the political representations, I, though I agree with you that that's very important, but also on the, uh, the kind of, you know, non-state, you know, collective organization, collective action side, because the, you know, the two things are not, you know, as I'm sure you would agree, they're not completely uh, disconnected. I, just as an illustration of this point, there was this, I, you've probably seen some of this chatter about this on uh, uh, Twitter. There was, you know, after the government reopened, uh, you know, lots of people were celebrating uh, Nancy Pelosi's political power and uh, uh, brilliance. I think some people had forgotten that this was the same Nancy. It was not a different Nancy Pelosi. It was the same Nancy Pelosi who basically was responsible for getting the Affordable Care Act uh, passed uh, when, uh, you know, uh, Rahm Emanuel was backing away from it and Obama was prepared to back away from it. And she put a little steel in some spine. So uh, this is not the first time she's been an effective uh uh, political player, but after you know, in the course of this celebration, there was the uh, uh, 
the, the reaction that this is ridiculous. Nancy Pelosi, this is not about Nancy Pelosi. This is because the air traffic controllers were about to go out on strike. The air traffic controllers and flight attendants, not government employees, but flight attendants in support of the air traffic controllers. Um, uh, in the spirit of representation has many forms. There were a bunch of us who thought, I don't know, it sounds like both and rather than uh, either or. But, you know, I do think it was uh, both and. And, and uh, uh, so, I, you know, I think if given the interest in in representation broadly, including political representation, but not exclusively political representation, it might be an interesting direction uh, for you to uh, think about to uh, engage. I'll, I'll just make a quick digression, which is that if perhaps uh, 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 Trump is not just a, a, a step along the spiraling down the drain, uh, but marks a marks the kind of terminus of one uh, course of uh, political development, and then we can have a kind of fresh start afterwards. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice sort of symmetry to, uh, to uh, <laughs> the conservative movement starting off with an uh, air traffic controller strike. Uh, absolutely. Trump is dying yeah. because yeah. of uh, air traffic controllers. Uh, uh, you're not the first person to have, uh, uh, to have observed that. We are both old enough to remember 1981 and... Uh, uh, Reagan and the air traffic controllers. And, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, and so a, a, a wonderful luxury of first leaving the kind of orthodox libertarian world and second working for a small new think tank is that we can say, we don't have an answer on that just yet. Uh, mm. uh, that this is, and this is an area where uh, all of us are thinking and talking about and, and on the issue of representation and particularly on lab alternatives, labor, yeah. lab <clears throat> new labor arrangements. Uh, we think this is an interesting area and, and, uh, and that there is a vacuum to be filled. How to fill it, uh, we're not sure yet, but I agree it's a, an area of real importance. The, 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 just to go back to the novelty of what we're doing on the right. Uh, let, let me just add one, uh, uh, just one point on yeah, that. Yeah, Sorry for it, but just uh, a, 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 a punctuation on that. There is actually uh, a project at, based at Harvard at Harvard Law School, I think it's at Harvard Law School, uh, about labor law reform. And it is called, promisingly enough from your point of view, the Clean Slate Project. And the idea is that maybe something fundamental, and people are not hostile to, you know, doing, you know, labor law reform in the, you know, NLRA uh, uh, tradition, but they're open to all kinds of other ideas. And so there's a, but this is something that's uh, essential anyway. I, I, it, and it's, but it's a potential point of contact. Yeah, Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Anyway, thank, thank you for that pointer. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we are offering sort of, you know, moderation on social issues, um, a, 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 you know, a, a, a a government that knows it has to spend money uh, to support uh, the economy um, and an approach to free markets where we're uh, going after big businesses that are at the trough. Yeah. Uh, so all of that is kind of the opposite of, of the current program. Um, uh, but I, I, I think it's uh, important to see uh, how the worst part of the current program, the, the divisive, uh, fear and resentment stoking um, culture war theatrics. Uh, how that element is codependent with the other elements. Uh, that is, because the Republican Party has no policy making agenda that offers any appeal to its base, all it offers is cutting the top marginal tax rate and cutting social spending as much as it can to pay for said tax cuts. Uh, it has to do something else to get their votes. And what it does is it stokes their fears and resentment and plays to their id. Uh, so uh, the only way to wean Republican offer seekers off of the culture war theatrics is to give them something they can run on that will actually be popular with their voters. So moving, moving the Republican Party away from this anti-government ideology towards uh, a, you know, an effective government ideology uh, is essential, I think, to uh, to uh, weaning the party from from its worst instincts. So, which is why I, we'll just yeah. mention briefly. Tucker Carlson did this monologue a few weeks ago, uh, where he was railing against uh, or, uh, uh, 
small government conservative elites for abandoning uh, uh, the working class. And that produced pushback from establishment conservatives, David French, a couple of others, um, arguing that this is really basically a cultural problem and that the public policy can't really do that much about it. And kind of, uh, and, and slamming Tucker for being, uh, for being a, a left-wing populist. Um, so, but what I, what they don't, so, so Tucker combines both. Tucker Carlson combines just raving, uh, uh, uh race baiting, uh, mm-hmm. and, stirring up immigrant hatred with this genuine economic populism he is touting. Um, and what the establishment conservatives don't recognize is that, uh, that by, uh, having the vapors over the idea of government doing anything affirmative to, to, uh, solve people problems and help people, they are locking in the worst part of Tucker Carlson, which is, which is the, uh, the ethnic and racial and religious. Yeah. Um, I, I want to be mindful of the time here, and I, I and I, I I don't want to get off the Tucker Carlson theme, but I but just on this theme of uh, program and finding uh, resonances with different people, one of the things that I found as an alternative to as a genuine alternative to using red meat as uh, 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 one of the things that I was a little bit surprised by in the piece. uh, And I have a thought about why the the roots of this is that there there wasn't any discussion of this kind of new enthusiasm for um, antitrust. Um, And there are a few reasons to think that that would be, uh, my guess is that you guys don't all see to eye, see eye to eye on it. That's a, that, that's, um, uh, by you guys, I mean the four co-authors of this thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the, the reason for thinking that antitrust would be, uh, a good, uh, you know, a c- component of what, what you're proposing is, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it deals to some extent with the power issue. It doesn't enhance the power of people who are vulnerable, but it diminishes the power of people who have overwhelming uh, power. It's uh, the, it's a pro-competitiveness uh, policy. Um, I mean, antitrust, you know, has become completely focused on issues about consumer welfare understood in terms of prices. And if you think that's what antitrust is all about, and then you look at Amazon or Google, you think the conversation is over. But if you think that it's about um, uh, that antitrust is about competitiveness and both the economic and political and social consequences of competitiveness, then there's a case there. It also is something that it continues um, in, in to have resonance in a variety of ways, both among people who you want to be in conversation with uh, on the right as uh, offering a center right ten poll, but also, uh, you know, it's a, as you know, it's a very, very big deal at the uh, Roosevelt Institute. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there are some people around who think, uh, no, no, don't use antitrust policy. Use, I don't know, public ownership or regulation or something like that. But there, but the Roosevelt policy and, you know, uh, Barry Lynn, open markets, et cetera, I, you know, very, very strong on uh, antitrust. So it deals to some extent with the, uh, the, the power issue. It also has uh, an opportunity aspect. This is something that Brandeis pointed out a long time ago. Uh, which is that, uh, you know, one reason for liking antitrust is what you've reduced as barriers for, uh, for, to entry for new, you know, for people who want to, uh, you know, set up uh, firms for entre- uh, entrepreneurship. It also arguably, again, you know, the literature on this is fluid and, and, and growing rapidly, but it also has something to say on the labor market side and also something to say on innovation and productivity side. So, uh, now, I know also that there is a very good case for thinking that, uh, you know, big firms are way better than small firms at, on a whole bunch of issues about compensation and health and safety protections and et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, it felt like a missed opportunity there. What's the yeah, source? So, of 
So I, I would say that it's true that uh, that we're all that the four of us aren't necessarily all of exactly the same mind on this, and we're and no, I think we're all also you know uh, don't have necessarily 100% settled views on this because it's an area that's in intellectual ferment right now. I think we could have cobbled together uh, uh, you know something that would have been fair to all of our points of view right now, uh, but it would have been kind of boring, and that's why it's not in there uh, because. Uh, I, I think this sort of new enthusiasm for antitrust is overblown. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, there's a, uh, you know, something must be done. Antitrust is something, therefore antitrust must be done kind of, uh, uh, yeah. going on, uh, to some extent. Um, I, on the one hand, I think that, uh, there are, there are tweaks that can be made to the analytical, uh, framework of antitrust to not just look at short-term price movements, but to think sort of longer term about how eliminating potential competitors could affect innovation down the line. Looking at labor market effects, monopsony effects is something that, that hasn't been done that much in the past. Industry by industry, I think there, that there are, there are cases to be made that antitrust has been asleep at the wheel. But, but to my mind, when you're talking about antitrust law, you must then dive into the weeds. You must talk about relevant markets and market power. And, and, and we have a whole, you know, analytical toolkit to do this. And it seems like in the current moment, to sort of put that to the side, use very broad uh, brush statistics to say concentration is this big problem. So we have that we need to have this sort of huge across the board antitrust activist solution. Don't buy that. Um, but, uh, but I, uh, yeah, but, I, but I, I, I'm not. I'm not uh, defending the status quo as. Yeah. as uh, you know. I, I think it's it's it be, for all the reasons that I mentioned because of the economic effects, because of the competitiveness issues, because of the issues about power and you know concentrated power. I think it's another area that would be you know w w maybe worth uh, playing in a little bit more. I do have to go in a second, but I'll just tell one last story on the issue, just on the analytical weeds issue that you were just mentioning. So I was having a conversation with somebody a couple of months ago um, on these issues about antitrust. Uh, and I mentioned something about, you know, as you said, there's a question about market definition. I mean, that's a, like a key question. Lots of economists and lawyers have gotten very rich off, you know, arguing about it. Uh, and uh, it, it, in, in the context of that discussion, I said something about how, you know, Apple had, uh, you know, maybe sort of 30, depending on the season, about 35 to 40 percent of the domestic smartphone market. And he said, yeah, but what percentage of the iPhone market do they have? <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, you know, it's a perfectly legitimate question. To ask because if you think this is a, that it's all about pricing power, right. um, you know, and you know, cross price elasticities to be in the weeds for a second, then you know, that's kind of a relevant question to ask at the same time. It seems sort of like a, like a complete joke. Anyway, <laughs> yes. uh, I, I think it's an area that's worth it. Yeah, so, I, I would say, bottom line, despite the kind of you know, this neo Brandeisian moment, economies of scale still exist, and yeah. ignoring them can get you into trouble. Uh, ignoring them to, can get you into trouble. Uh, uh, there are network externalities. I think there's an interesting study to be written uh, on, here's a particular question, which is, so uh, Google started this, uh, you know, alternative to uh, Facebook called Google Plus. It's been right. shut down now. Uh, what initially happened when Google set up Google Plus is it, it was growing pretty fast. They were doing pretty well. Uh, now I know the story with, you know, that people tell at 30,000 feet, which is, yeah, but net, network externalities. There's another story that you could tell, which is that Google is basically not a product company and they didn't invest very much in making Google Plus a place where people wanted to go. And had they done so and had they really cared about it, uh, there would be, there might be two. Maybe they would have won the competition and maybe there's room for only one, but there might have been two or other uh, platforms out there. I think people are a little bit too quick in this area to invoke um, 
issues around economies of scale and network externalities and like that and insufficiently attentive to many other sources. But anyway, this is a larger conversation yeah, so, yeah, what, to what have done, another time. What you've done a great job of is, is showing that this piece that we've written, it, it's interesting, it's interesting as it's part of a conversation, uh, but, but sort of setting up a, a new perspective or a different perspective in the political debate from which to dive into the weeds of this or that issue. And we're looking forward to doing that going forward and chatting with you as we do. Good. Okay. Great to talk, Frank, as ever. Bye-bye. Okay.